Hi, this is Nikita Petrov. I'm speaking to you from uh, a field in the Ostrov region, in the Pskov Oblast, in Russia. And all of that is very appropriate because the conversation you're about to hear is about Russia. I'm talking to Gary Lackman, who is... He's been on the show before. We talked about his previous book, Dark Star Rising, which deals with... Uh, he looks at this resurgence of occult or magical... Uh, thinking in politics in Russia and in the U.S. Uh, ideas about like Kag, the god of chaos, who uh, is associated with Pepe the Frog, who is in turn associated with Donald Trump. And now he's published a new book called The Return of Holy Russia, uh, and and it's kind of an offshoot of that uh, previous one. So he started writing about Russia in Dark Star Rise, and then it seems like he uh, kind of couldn't stop and uh, went down the rabbit hole of just learning about Russia and Russian history and the history of Russian thought and Russian thought about Russia. And uh, he produced this volume, this uh, long and fascinating book. It's a page-turner because it's just filled with strange and uh, kind of larger-than-life characters and uh, stories and uh, strange ideas that I think some of them are, you know, really compelling. In any case, they're quite interesting. So the book is great, and the conversation was a lot of fun. Uh, obviously, it's more special for me. Maybe, right? Because uh, the reason it's special to me is because the book is kind of about me. It's uh, about this character, the Russian man, the Russian soul. And uh, I am a Russian man with a Russian soul. But on the other hand, I kind of know the territory and for you there might be a lot of new interesting ideas here uh, and maybe there's significance kind of political significance to it too because uh, we need to figure out what relationship Russia has to the rest of the world and that is something that both Russians and people outside of Russia uh, could use you know figuring that out so Without further ado, this is my conversation with Gary Lackman. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I hope you buy his book too. And I also hope that you subscribe to my newsletter at psychopolitica.com where I think I'll publish a little something based on this conversation. I'm working on this sketch for kind of like an alternative cover for the book. Uh, so this is it. I'll talk to you later. Bye. The first thing I wanted to do is uh, to say thank you for, for this book because um, it's – I mean, it is a great book. I think anybody who is curious about Russia or even just a generally curious person would appreciate it because, as I say, it's packed with fascinating stories of these different characters, many of whom are larger than life. And uh, the stories themselves are really interesting and it's all woven together into this big narrative of what Russia is. And there's – you know, value to this, to that you're trying to extract from the Russian story that would be worthwhile for people outside of the country and all that. So I, I highly recommend it to anybody listening. But for me personally, it's a, a bit of a different story because I'm Russian. I'm in Russia. Um, and as you correctly write in the book, uh, the relationship between Russians and Russia is not uh, an easy one. There's a lot of anxiety connected to it, whether we're good guys or bad guys, whether there are redeeming qualities to all the suffering or complications that uh, the country has gone through, whether we matter at all and all that kind of stuff. And it really helps, uh, in, you know, in my life, it really helped knowing people from outside the country to try to think about it and talk about it and explain uh, what Russia is to them, and by doing so, explain it to myself. And reading your book gave me a similar kind of feeling. Like, it's not exactly a conversation. It's you telling me what you found rather than me trying to explain it to you. But uh, it it gave me a good feeling. I think you get it. And uh, and I was uh, happy to to see your perspective and your tone of voice and your way of approaching the uh, topic is also, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that. As you say in the beginning of the book, 
I, I suppose it's like one of the impetus for writing the book was that you saw how some other writers reacted to you, um, that list of philosophers that uh, were, was on a, uh, on a suggestion list for governors uh, that uh, was sent from the administration of the president. And uh, that was the, the, the reaction uh, that, uh, that the many Western writers had was simplistic and kind of um, uh, making it worse than, than not giving it appreciative kind of attention. So, uh, so there's that. And there's, thank right, you for right. writing this. Well, uh, absolutely my pleasure, Nikita, and thank you for um, having me on again. But, uh, well, that was really sort of the impetus for the book, what you just said was, um, I mean, I should make clear, I'm not a Russian scholar, I'm not, or right. I, I'm, I've kind of become one by writing the book. I mean, uh, but I'm not a Russian scholar. Scholar, I, I don't have any degrees. Uh, I don't speak Russian. I've never, never been. Um, but I did read some of the people that was on, on these reading lists, um, specifically Nikolai Berdyaev and Vladimir Soloviev. Um, I, did, I, I didn't know Ivan Ilyin's work at all, so um, I wasn't familiar with that. Uh, but I just thought, as you said, <clears throat> the reaction from some Western um, critics and journalists to it. Um, you know, you can't expect them to be too subtle, but I just thought it was very, uh, well, I thought it was very severe and I also was very ignorant in some ways because they tried to present Berdyaev and Soloviev as these um, very pro-nationalist, um, what, what we would call exceptionalist sort of um, visionaries for Russia's destiny and all that. And yes, it's true. I mean, this notion of Russia having some, if not messianic, certainly a very significant role to play in world events or world history um, hundred years ago, you know, before, before the uh, Bolshevik uh, revolution, this was something that um, quite a few people talked about. And in the West as well. I mean, I started out by saying that, you know, people like Rudolf Steiner and Hermann Hesse and Oswald Spengler and others. I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, they were non-Russians somehow, but in any case, that, that's what sort of said, Oh, well, this is actually kind of wrong. You know? And I, I thought that was, uh, I mean, whatever, whatever the Russian government's um, motives for, mm -hmm. you know, Sending these reading lists out, it's, I think these people are, you know, worth knowing and reading and, and, and worth understanding what they're saying, not just rejecting it. And then, I mean, you already said, yeah, it's just once I started sort of looking into it, because I, I didn't know much about Russian history. I mean, aside from around the time of the revolution, let's say Rasputin and all that sort of thing, um, I just became fascinated with it. And I didn't start out wanting to write a history of Russia. And I just thought, what am I doing here? It's like, I'm writing a history of Russia. And I was like, well, it just, it's just the stories and, and this narrative. And I just, and I just learned as I went. And I just, um, that's why I say I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I, you know, I know, uh, a, 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 a damn sight more about Russia now than I, than I ever did. And it was all fascinating. And it is full of these larger than life characters and these great struggles of power and, and, and all that. So I just was captivated by it. And then um, I, I just went on. Did you come to any kind of a conclusion about the connection between the actual Russian state now and these ideas that uh, in that case, like the administration of the president referenced and Putin quoted some of these people in some of his speeches. Um, did you personally come out with a, a conclusion whether he had, or they actually care about this stuff or actually put thought in it or use it for uh, propaganda reasons. It's not, it's not like a study of Putin per se. I mean, right. he's sort of the trigger for doing it. And then of course he's in there. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't, I mean, he's a politician, you know, obviously. And so politicians are strategists and tacticians and first job of a politician is to stay in power. And he seems to be very good at that. Um, uh, uh, but at the same time, I did, I did get the impression that again, and this is something I think people that are a bit in sympathy to some degree with Russia. And I have, we have to say, you know, there's practically everyone I talk to, uh, not, uh, uh, quite a few of the, doing these interviews. I mean, they can't get away from Russia is the USSR. Right. So when I say Russia, they think USSR. And I, and I say, well, it's kind of like when you say Germany, you, you mean the Nazis and mm. enough time has passed and maybe in, in the eyes of other nations, Germany's done enough <laughs> good things since then to be kind of let back in the club. But we still think, oh, no, Russia, they're, you know, they're the evil empire or something like that. But in any case, um, uh, so I just had you say, well, actually, no, that's a relatively short period in, in a thousand year, you know, history, um, at least a thousand years. So 
Um, but just just saying that, um, I don't know. I just get the impression that sort of in general, there's a more bookish literary kind of sense to you know. Um, I mean, Trump, you know, I don't, if, he, he, if he suggests any books to read, they'd be his own books about, you know, the right. art of the Trump is a pretty low bar, though, in, in that particular respect. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm sure. I know you can trip over um, the goalpost. Uh, but um, I just mean in the sense that it, it just intrigued me that any world leader was offering mm -hmm. not only philosophy, but difficult philosophers that are dealing with, you know, spiritual issues, you know, not not like the latest I don't know. I don't know if there's any philosopher. I guess some political philosophers maybe in, in the West are, you know, brought in. But these are these are issues about what we consider existential issues about the meaning of life and, and you know the meaning of history and where is everything going and um, all of this sort of and you know the the loss of the soul in the modern world and um, so that was the concern of these philosophers hundred years ago and it seems that you know for whatever reason that seems to be kind of the mantle that. Uh, Putin seems to be adopting not only on himself but for Russia standing in right. the world. It's it's a country now that's embracing these things. I mean, <clears throat> how much he himself really believes in it, I, I don't know. It's kind of like asking, you know, how much did Mick Jagger really believe in black magic and <laughs> and Satanism? When you know, it's like, well, he was reading the books and you know everybody was talking about it, but it was a tactic. And then after a while, you know, he dropped out of it. So um, right. I don't know, but I mean, it, that shouldn't stop us from reading them and trying to understand because. The thing I tried to say at the end of the book is I think these thinkers had something to offer to the West a um, hundred years ago when they were stopped you know, by the Bolsheviks. And now they're back around and we can still learn something from what they had to offer. I, I when um, going through, I was kind of jumping back and forth through the book uh, to get a, a more um, whole idea of what it's uh, about before the interview at the end. You're uh, in the conclusion. You're uh, kind of saying it in a sense. It doesn't matter whether Putin reads them or not. And it made me just an association with my in my head uh, uh, appear that I want to share with you. There's an idea that I uh, one of my favorite kind of elements of the modern uh, I call it like Russian political mythology or something. Meaning it's a thing that. An idea, a version of which you can hear from a taxi driver here, a person you meet at the bar there, and mostly it's done jokingly, but then occasionally you meet a person who uh, actually believes in some version of this idea, and that's the idea that Putin does not even exist. <laughs> there are versions of it. There's like either there are doubles of Putin and the original right. Putin is dead and it's uh, all an act, or there are like androids, and different models of Putin that are sent for different reasons, like uh, depending on what the the uh, issue of the day is, uh, a different kind of robot will address it. And um, and I think many of these, y you could trace some of these ideas to uh, a book written by Viktor Pelevin in the, uh, I think it's, it was late 90s, uh, in, in the Russian version, it's called Generation P, the premise of which is, all of the politicians and all of the everything that you see in the news is all CGI graphics right. created by uh, like the low level of uh, a person working in this system would be advertiser. And well, then as you Sir climb Sirkov, further, Sirkov, right? Let us love Sirkov. Right, right, and and Sirkov, Sirkov, show, Sirkov is right, that yeah. kind of a person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing you know, you you uh, what were you saying earlier? Oh, about about. Um, you're saying about uh, oh, the Putin doesn't really exist. That was because right. you get somebody have a bus campaign. Because I don't know if you know here, um, people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher, Hitch Christopher Hitchens, these atheists, they had a <laughs> campaign with the buses. God, God probably doesn't exist. So just, <laughs> right. So just carry on. Yeah, I've seen graffitis like that with Putin is an illusion or Putin is a right. mass psychosis. Right. Well, he's a he's a very very good one. You know, he's been able to maintain his. Um, illusory reality for quite some time you know? right so in any case yeah that that, that is, is an important uh, idea to me because it's you see it expressed in a bunch of different ways in modern russian culture mm. and that uh that says to me that it's a part of how russians today think about power mm. but uh let's go back to these uh thinkers not just the three mentioned in the list, but, uh, you know, over the course of the book, you 
uh, look at many Russian thinkers and you do find some of the like common traits. And you mentioned one uh, that troubled those uh, people who wrote the reviews in English, uh, the idea of Russian exceptionalism. There's a, a version of it that, that is my favorite. Again, I, I have a kind of affinity to ideas that so outlandish that I'm not like scared that they're going to, uh, you know, trick me into believing them wholeheartedly. Right, right, right. And then what happens is I find myself a year down the road talking about this <laughs> idea. They, they see, get they around slowly, my defenses. Slowly infected you. Right. Yeah. So one of those, it's one of those cosmists. I forget who exactly ah. that is. It must have been Fyodorov who hmm. made the case. He said that Russia is supposed to become the global civilization, the planetary civilization, because the relationship of Russians to Russia is similar to the relationship of humankind to the cosmos, meaning it's just this mm. vast expanse. Uh, you're going to try to civilize it and build things there, but eventually it's just going to swallow you probably. It's it's this, uh, you know, un, it's not inhabited yet, and it's uh, not at all clear whether you can inhabit this. Mm. Uh, huge expense. So that that's an idea that, uh, you know, a version of that idea that I can kind of entertain just because I find it uh, mm -hmm. interesting, funny, that there are qualities to it that are endearing to me. But what do you make of, how do you, how would you phrase the version of this, like exceptionalism that you see in different well, I mean, thinkers? Well, I mean, there's exceptionalism, I guess, as a, you know, I guess it's narrow or a particularly political or socio political uh, interpretation now that, mm -hmm. you know, your nation is somehow different than all of the nations. And but, I mean, there's that, but it's also, it's, um, I mean, America has that too. There's the great destiny of America. America right. they went to the East to the West coast and, you know, it's obvious that this is our destiny and all of that. And, um, you know, Reagan was talking about that sort of stuff in the eighties. So, um, but I think um, with, with the, I mean, you talk about the cosmos. Yeah, I mean, there's this, there is this um, tendency for these vast ideas, these huge universal ideas. And <clears throat> excuse me, in a way, it, it might, it might be able to understand it in, in a neat little formula that uh, the German philosopher Oswald Spengler. Uh, he's 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 not on everyone's book list these days, but oh, they could be. I mean, he wrote the Decline of the West, and you know, it's he might be a bit more spot on now than he was 100 years ago. It's one of those. <laughs> the the decline of the West and the the just the term the Russian soul are things oh. that a a big portion of Russians when you just mention it scoff like I was reading your book and I uh, oh. was about to tell my girlfriend that it's I just found it interesting that from the early pages you start using the term the Russian soul where normally uh, maybe with a different uh, culture you would say character or mentality oh, right 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 right. right? right. And I, w I couldn't even get to that point because the minute I mentioned the Russian soul, she just went with the Russian soul again. Instead of <laughs> fixing the road or doing something real in this uh, world, there's just this there. talking. To... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no, I can understand. I mean, I, 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 I try at different points to say, you know, um, I'm sorry if this is cliched and all that, but, you know. Give me a break. But, uh, well, I mean, I'll quickly get through this then. So Spengler basically says the difference between the Russian character and the Westerner. It's the Westerner, <laughs> if you look at the Gothic Church, it's this soaring spire, you know, stretching out in, in up to into space, and um, it's it's the Western eye, the ego, you know, reaching up to heaven or God. And um, but um, according to Spengler, a lot of Russians don't do that. They look out. <laughs> they look out into the horizon. I mean, I, I I say I haven't been there, so I I can't I can't take this as a matter of fact. But I guess. Um, geo you know uh, geographically that would make sense so just psycho geographically right, right, right. that would make sense because you have these vast expanses of you know i, I guess your girlfriend's going to say oh there's the vast expanses again and the steps <laughs> and all of that but that's the idea well i guess in, i mean back in back in the day in america that was the west you know this way out right. west you know right, we got right, this, right. you know it, you know so and uh yeah so there's a sense of a we you know rather than just an i and somehow that would be this cosmic kind of embrace. You know, there's, um, there's a sense of being in, you know, uh, in the world. And that, you know, that translates in a lot of ways. I mean, you talk about the cosmos. There's other ones like Vernatsky mm -hmm. and uh, Silkovsky and Chizhevsky. And they're all talking about in different ways that, um, 
humanity is not this fluke accident, you know, happening in this mechanical universe. It's part of the same processes going on on the earth, just as clouds and trees and herds of animals are. And we play this cosmic role. And, you know, they're talking about the newest sphere back before Teo de Chardin and all that. And so a lot of these ideas and Vernatsky's ideas are involved in biosphere too, and uh, all of that kind of thing. And, um, there's a weird connection between that and Bannon because Bannon was involved in, in biosphere too, but let's not go there. So, the, but one of the points I try to make is you, it does seem to be, there is this kind of sense and not, over, not only in these eccentric, let's say philosophers, at least from the Western point of view, like the cosmos, you have it in Tolstoy and war and peace, you know, Napoleon isn't this great man who impresses his power and dominates dominates it's a big word Mm -hmm. these days in the news he dominates his will upon the people he's a cork thrown up by the you know the waves of history and all this so it's this antithesis to this western idea of this heroic individual who conquers and it's more like no you're part of this huge kind of reaching out mass sort of thing right and there's this ongoing again throughout the centuries and up until now battle between or not even the battle. One of the things that you say that as you try to describe this like Russian character, which again I'm 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 not holding it against you for using right. the Russian soul and and all that stuff. I I'm perfectly fine with it. I think that the problem that some people have is not that like my girlfriend had. It's not even that it's a cliche. It's just that Russians talk about the Russian soul as well instead of, like, fixing the things that yeah, you can sure, touch. Sure, sure, Well, I'm, I'm sure it must be the same thing as, as, or similar to, say, somewhere in India, where the Westerners are always talking mm-hmm. about, you know, Indian spirituality and Gandhi and all this kind of thing, and people are, you know, well, maybe not as much today, but still, you know, uh, living in poverty and, right, and so, right. so on. So, oh, yeah, no, sure. I mean, but, <clears throat> again, you know, I'm, you know, I'm talking about I'm, I'm, a lot of different sources. I mean, the, <clears throat> the phrase I do kind of use is Russian man. Right. Um, I mean, there is the Russian soul, the Russian psyche. This is supposed to be a character of, of, and all that. And of course, all this is coming through what Western sources, you know, so, or translations of, of Russian philosophers and all that. But you, you, you know, you kind of do have it in Gogol, you know, he's, he's the, the, you know, the Troika's, rolling off into the infinite spaces and, and into the night and Russia, where are you? And, and right, you know, right, right. kind of thing. So, I mean, it does, I mean, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's loaded with cliches for a, a, a Russian reader. Um, uh, but I'm, you know, just, just as many cliches about the French or the Germans or. Sure. No. And I, and I think those, I mean, these are cliches for, for a reason. They, yeah, they, they become yeah. a cliche because you see this idea expressed a bunch of times in, in all of this, writing there is yeah. i have uh, a book on my shelf you 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 definitely mention uh Mamleyev, one of the um kind right, of yeah, yeah. later soviet uh writers i have the, he wrote a book called russia the eternal which yeah. was his uh attempt at figuring out what russia is and, and explaining this like idea of russia which is again a task that it's like it's always there. Nobody ever completes it. And Russians are always kind of freaking out about whether we know what Russia is and trying to approach it. And one right. of the points he makes there, uh, which I found uh, very true and because of that somewhat funny, uh, he makes this analysis of Russian patriotic poetry. So poetry about Russia. Mm, mm. And there's a lot of that. And, you know, as, as, as a Russian growing up here in school, you learn like the classics, you're given a, sure, a certain yeah. kind of, selection of those and it's the case that in many of those um you know the poet would express his love towards the country but it's always like i love you russia but it's a strange kind of love or (laughs) or the 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 one that is quoted quoted the most i think in in terms of like this patriotic like a staple of patriotic patriotic poetry is uh, a poem by tuchif where he says that uh, the, his version of Russian exceptionalism, I suppose, is he says, Russia cannot be understood by the mind, cannot be measured by a common measure. Russia is something that you can only believe in. Oh. And so there's always this, like, it's almost like the relationship to Russia is but of, of the, a Russian who feels a kind of love towards it mm. is almost like a relationship of like a troubled religious person to God or something like you're, you're oh, I would, chasing I it. Say, yeah. I mean, again, from my um, perspective, limited perspective that, that 
that sounds pretty accurate. Um, and um, I mean, the other this Russian man idea is that it's this huge character that's able to, in his her capacious soul, is able to um, accommodate all different opposite oppositions and contradictions right. and all these kind of things that would a Westerner just would have a nervous breakdown uh, doing, or you know, it just. Uh, um, they're just not able to do that. And this was the threat that um, Hesse, and, and, and he, he didn't mean threat in some kind of, you know, a Russophobic way, but in the sense that this, this was on its way, you know, the same way Nietzsche was like saying, you know, nihilism is on its way. Um, this was on its way. Uh, and he saw it in the novels of Dostoevsky and it was this tremendous, turbulent, primal kind of power. And Berdayev, who's Russian, um, um, or was at least, um, he says the same thing. He says the, the, in, in this book, the Russian idea, you know, the Russian psyche is this, it has this tremendous primal power, um, but it's not, it doesn't have form, it doesn't have any, any, it needs a form. And so somehow, um, and this is something that James Billington, who's a, a great American historian of, of Russia, and he wrote this huge book that uh, it's called The Icon and the Axe, which uh, I, I plundered shamelessly. Um, but uh, he, he, he says what, the, in, in another book, he says what seems to be typical of Russian culture and art is that they take something on from somewhere else mm -hmm. and they take the form on from somewhere else and then they do something to it that makes it, you know, very, very different and, and almost completely new. And then, so they transform it into something else. So they kind of, so there is this sense that there's something vast and big and turbulent and, you know, the, the prima materia kind of thing. And it somehow needs, um, you know, this, what do you want to call it, logical or more masculine or something kind of form. And I guess this is the myth too that I know, Again, what I understand, what should they call the more Western leaning Russians or more progressive uh, mm -hmm. Russians um, say, oh, no, this is the old story that we had to get the Vikings come to like, you know, um, right. rule us because we did, we couldn't do it ourselves. And, you know, uh, rather than you come and raid us every six months, why don't you come here? We'll put you up. We'll treat you really nice. You can protect us from the other Vikings <laughs> and then you can kind of give us some order and uh, Rurik and, and, and his his gang. And so. I mean, that's, is that myth? Is that real? You know, is that something that's, that's used politically at different times? And I, I try to give some equal time to Novgorod because that, that seemed to be at least historically a place of a more liberal or Western right, or whatever democratic, you want to call democrat, like, democratic kind of thing. And yeah. that they, they've always seemed to get, you know, kind of trounced by uh, Moscow throughout most of the history and all that. So you, uh, it, it, this is the part in your book that I, uh, haven't read thoroughly enough to, to uh, really understand your uh, take on it. But at, at some points in the book, you talk about the, you know, the Bolshevik experiment as mm -hmm. a thing that put an end to a lot of these trains of thoughts because, you know, a lot of people were either killed or exiled or imprisoned. Uh, and then there's this like hiatus of, of, 70 years. At the same time, there is a, a way of looking at the Bolshevik experiment. Like you said, you know, Russians take something from the outside, like Marxism, you know, originated from Germany and do something with it. And then, uh, you know, me growing up after the collapse of the Soviet Union, looking back at that story, I, I always felt that, uh, it quickly morphed into a version of something that was present before. There's the exceptionalism, uh, a version of it in, in that there's this great mission. There is, it's supposed to be a completely atheistic, situ materialistic situation, but there's an apocalyptic quality to it in, in that, that it, we're trying to bring uh, an end to the existing world and uh, the common, you know, classless society and all that. And there's a mummy of the main leader in the, in the square, so there is a kind in, of theocratic... In, in a four-dimensional cube right. uh, designed by, I forget the architect, but Majevich had the idea for it, you know, yeah. and he came from theosophical ideas. So um, so do you uh, see the Soviet uh, part as, as a continuation of that uh, previous uh, thing? Well, I mean, not? there's certainly, I mean, I uh, again, um, it strikes me that initially Lenin was, you know, really trying to eliminate inwardness, you know, eliminate right. this soul kind of thing because that was just in the way that was just something that you know was stopping the revolution from taking place and all that um but then you know it seemed again like when stalin got into power it um it did morph into um something that was more like the earlier czars or like like you know the the 
earlier time. Um, and also, uh, certainly by the time of um, uh, the Great War or the Great Patriotic War, it, it wasn't it wasn't the um, international Marxism and and the steady march right. of you know towards the class of society it was Mother Russia. You know, and and all of that. So, and Stalin became, you know, the Man of Steel, this kind of, you know, super Superman, godlike kind of character. And there's the funny story you know, I tell in the book. I forget who is it that talks about it, but um, I think uh, what was it after Stalin's death? Um, this some some woman in the Politburo had a dream where she said Lenin didn't like Stalin mm-hmm. being buried next to him, and so they. Act, I don't know if it's true, but the source said that they actually moved him. So, you know, so still this kind of, so, and you know, there's all the stories about the the interest in what became known as parapsychology. Um, right. I guess it was psychical research back then. You know, the what is it, Gleb Gleb Bucky or Bucky and um, Alexander Barchenko. Uh, this is an interesting book called Red Shambhala, um, and it's about how. Barchenko was this doctor, but he sort of, you know, wasn't really on, on the list, on the register, uh, but he was deeply interested in a variety of different esoteric practices and like Tibetan Buddhism and medicine and all this kind of stuff. And Bucky was somebody, he was the security, uh, he was the head of security d- during like the terror, you know, the, 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 the purges. Um, mm-hmm. And then he got sickened by what was happening. I mean, he was idealist about the revolution and, you know, sort of a real true, you know, way and then he just was sickened by the carnage and they had the strength they came together and that's a great story by itself but they had the strange idea that if they could go to tibet they'd be able to bring back these kind of spiritual teachings that would be able to actually transform the revolution to what it should be this kind of brotherhood you know this kind of harmony among all of us and through these spiritual practices that would you know emanate and then also that the the yogis and the monks up there had what they call super science uh they had you know, some kind of fantastic um, you know, way of harnessing some strange powers and energies. Nicholas Rorick was somebody else who, who mm-hmm, thought this was mm-hmm. the case. It's the kind of thing that years later turned up. Um, there was a, a British writer named T. Lob Song Rampa, um, who wrote all these books about his previous life in Tibet. He, 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 he never left sort of Devon or something, but you know, he, but he wrote all these, but he has this one called The Cave of the Ancients and it's about precisely all this kind of super science and, and nuclear energy forces that the Tibetan yogis have. So they really believe this was true. And then there's a whole story about Nicholas Rorick, who's the great painter and mystic and um, who uh, was the inspiration for and the set designer for the Rite of Spring, mm-hmm. um, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. He wanted to set up an independent um, pan-Buddhist nation in Inner Mongolia. Right. And he was trying to get the, the Bolsheviks um, you know, involved. His story... Is, I'm not again educated enough to, to say this with, uh, confidence, but it's, it's interesting that his story, his coming to it through the kind of the red part of, mm. of the red white divide, right? But it, it seems to be similar to the, uh, Baron Jungern's, uh, situation, oh. the, the white, uh, yeah. Warlord, you could yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, I, I could, I think I just name checked him in a footnote. I couldn't get him in, but that's a utterly fantastic story. Uh, Ungarn, yeah, who, who actually had this kind of army. I mean, uh, Rorik started out as a vociferous anti-Bolshevik and he was right, you know, he left early, early on and he wrote lots of anti-Bolshevik articles and white Russian kind of stuff. But then when he, when he, what he wanted to do, because he believed in this myth of Shambhala, or at least he wanted to use the myth of Shambhala, which was this, secret city or secret hidden um, um, society of civilization somewhere in, in the Gobi Desert or wherever it might be. <clears throat> but it goes back to the Kala Chakra Tantra and this um, Tibetan teachings. And he, he sort of wanted, and it talks about the um, the return of, of this, this hero who was going to sort of inaugurate this new age and so on. And he sort of wanted to use that to set up this whole um, uh, kind of thing. And, um, he never really got around to it, but Baron Ungon actually had, you know, he was actually, you know, he had his uh, country in his hands for a while. And right, it's, had a... I mean, the story, I, and I, I think anybody mentioned so, I just think of when he was finally caught and, um, executed, but apparently he took a medal that he got, some metal, and he chewed it rather than let it get into the hands of... <laughs> I haven't heard that part. So he was, oh, yeah, this is in, uh, who is it, uh, Osandowski's um, book, uh, Beast Gods and um, 
I forget what the other one is, which he talks about, um, he talks about Shambhala in there as well. Mm -hmm. So no, there's all, all, all these kinds of things. And, and that, you know, went on until everyone knows into the sixties and seventies, there was all the, all the, the book side about, um, you know, the Soviet espionage being interested in right, remote right. viewing, just like in the States, you know, and all that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. but again, from my perspective, an American living in England, um, and re reading books off and on about it, you know, for years, I just always got the impression that it was somehow more out in the open or somehow it wasn't so strange that this would be happening there. Whereas if you hear about it in the States, oh, my God, I can't believe they're they're putting money into this there. So I, I, I don't know if that's just propaganda or, you know, national profiling or whether it really is the case that because of the Russian soul, they're, <laughs> they're more open <laughs> to, to these kinds of things. I mean, in, in the Soviet Union, certainly you're, you're not supposed to entertain these ideas, but I think there is nascent in, in mm. all of these iterations of, of the Russian mm. uh, identity to today's one. There is one of the qualities that you ascribe to this like Russian man, which I think is correct, is this uh, tendency or, uh, or uh, always an attempt to unite the opposites. Mm -hmm. And the rationality with the absurd or appreciation of the absurd and mysticism with science and all of these things, they always somehow like there is a, one of my favorite little bits of pieces about the modern Russian identity uh, bits of information is there was this poll that they did um, asking people. There were a bunch of questions, but two of the questions on the poll were, do you consider yourself Eastern Christian, Orthodox Christian, right? The Russian branch of Christianity. And then another question was, do you believe in God? And at that, this poll was maybe like 10 years ago or something. And 70% of people said that they are Orthodox Christian. And of those 70, 30 said they do not believe in God. <laughs> there you go. And I mentioned there's, there's this. The rest the call. Is there, right? Right? <laughs> and, I, and I mentioned that at the, like a gathering of my parents' friends, so the generation, um, uh, you know, above me. And I mentioned that as a, like a curiosity and an obviously absurd kind of situation. And one of them went like, that would be me. That's that, mm -hmm. that describes me. I would call myself, uh, you know, Russian Orthodox, pretty much an atheist though. And, and it's, and, and the guy is smart and educated and, uh, you know, can explain it in rational terms too. you know, put, uh, give an interpretation of what it would mean. Like culturally, there's a lot that we inherited from the, uh, religious tradition, but then I personally don't have a connection to God, but there's something about this that you just see it so often in so, uh, in, in different versions that, uh, it, it does seem that it's just a quality of, um, thought here mm. that these things can be combined and maybe should be combined in weird uh, ways. Yeah. Well, I mean, that reminds me of a story about um, P.D. Uspensky, who's mm -hmm. um, he's most known in the West as being, um, you know, the most articulate um, exponent of Gurdjieff's philosophy. But as you know, he was, you know, a very important philosopher and writer in his own right. And he, he comes out of the Silver Age. He was one of the people that was... Um, a frequenter of the Stray Dog Cafe with people like Bieli and Bryusov and Anna Akhmatova and all that. But he, he tells a story somewhere. Um, I don't know if it's something he tells for his own life or in his novel, Strange Life of Ivan Osokin. But uh, there's a, he and a friend, they're asked to sign something in some kind of guest book. And the one friend writes, you know, whatever happens, always remember that, you know, two plus two equals four. And Uspensky writes the same thing, but he says, whatever happens, always remember two plus two equals five <laughs> um, instead. So it's this kind of, um, I mean, it's in a way you can say it's almost, you know, Dostoevsky in Notes from Underground, um, he, he's uh, the, the Beatle man, the underground man right. says, yes, after you, after you show me how everything works out to this fantastic plan and it's all in this rational order and everything's working out to this great, you know, a blueprint of, of everything, uh, I, I'll, go insane on purpose just to show that I'm free, you know, just to show that I'm not just a cog in a wheel and all that. So again, this is, Bedayev says this, there's this kind of refusal um, in something in, uh, in Russian psyche, character, culture, history, 
um, to accept necessity in some way, or, 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 or it's a complete kind of fatalism where it's a complete kind of plunge into it. Again, this is, again, this is a Russian, um, writing in, you know, the West after being exiled from Russia by Lenin. He was on one of the philosophy steamers with, with so many others. And it's this idea where, you know, it's, it's either this volcanic eruption of energy and, you know, refusal to submit to any system, or it's this kind of slavish, Somnolence, uh, you know, uh, like uh, uh, like uh, Oblomov, you know, who you know, takes a chapter to get out of bed and sits in right. front of the stove all right. day. So right. again, this is these kind of contradictions, you know. And um, I guess the idea was back then, and maybe we can learn something from that now. That maybe in some way that you know, it's out of that those contradictions that 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 protean chaos as Nietzsche said the dancing star you know you have, have day, chaos in yourself to give birth to a dancing star and um the chaos is fine and dandy but it's the dancing star that you're really you know going for <laughs> and you know is that's the idea that you know maybe out of that something still can come so um i don't know i mean does russia today does it have this kind of messianic character that some people like Alexander Dugan, I, I get the impression he, you know, I, I don't know if he's in the news anymore, or, but he's the one who sort of was having that kind of idea with the Eurasia meme and things of that sort. So um, I, that's, I, I don't necessarily see it in that way, but, you know, it may, who knows the way things are going, you know, in the world, who knows what, what might happen in that way. But I think we can learn something from, from their ideas because they were trying to be a complement to or to compensate for what was lacking in the West. I'm, I'm talking about these early, the Silver mm-hmm. Age guys again. You know, they were trying to complement, compensate for this, well, again, the loss of the soul in a sense, because the West had become just mechanistic and utilitarian and completely pragmatic and uh, all of that. And that's why Dostoevsky was preferring to go mad rather than right, right, right. submit to, to, to... I think he actually uses in the notes from the underground, he talks about two plus two equaling four and not being happy about it. Yeah, that might be it. That might that might yeah. be where Spensky got it. Um, and, you know, but um, yeah. So there is this kind of, um, and again, Berdaya. He, he's, I mean, out of all these ones, the 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 thinkers, the philosophers, he's the one I I know the most because I, I was reading his books for a long time. I first came across him, I was back in the seventies, um, late seventies, after I'd read uh, Colin Wilson because he talks about him a bit in some of his books. I think The Outsider. He talks about Dostoevsky and Berdaya wrote. A, book about Dostoevsky and so I was reading Dostoevsky and then I came across one of his books at the first Barnes and Noble um, mm. secondhand bookshop there was one just one ages ago there's none now any case but it, it was like oh and I just read it and then I just started reading his books and he's one of these really fascinating characters because he's uh, starts out as a Marxist but he's also a Christian but he's really on the fringe he's an eccentric Christian he gets kind of excommunicated or whatever you know um kicked out or something the equivalent of. And then he's this existentialist um, who's obsessed with freedom and, you know, is um, influenced by people like Jakob Burma and, you know, the, the Protestant, the, you know, the, the, the mystical cobbler, you know, the Jakob Burma, this Bohemian, you know, cobbler who saw this glint of light on, on a, on a pewter dish and sent him into this ecstasy where he, he, was looking into the heart of nature and has this very, you know, he wrote, he wrote these incomprehensible books in this very, you know, strange alchemical language that he borrowed from Paracelsus. But it's about this, the Ungrund, you know, this groundless freedom out of which even God comes, you know, God, God isn't the ultimate source of all things. God, God, him or her itself is rooted in this groundless, this groundlessness, you know, so it's, you know, it's, um, the, his ideas, I found fascinating. And so a lot of his books are translated into English. So I, I read them for, you know, quite some time. Have you found anybody, uh, maybe in, in research in this book, uh, more contemporary, more modern that, uh, struck a chord with you that you found, um, you know, worthwhile? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, you mean like really contemporary, like today, working today. I, I can't say I'm, I'm up to speed with that, but um, I was introduced to um, people's work. Um, they're not contemporary, but the more, you know, they're, uh, they be- become um, uh, kind of contemporary. Uh, Daniel Andreev, um, mm-hmm. who was um, the son of Leonid Andreev, who was, you know, the 
I was going to say he was the great nihilist writer, but I don't know if you can be a great nihilist. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, he was this nihilist writer um, in, in the early 20th century. And uh, he, he was imprisoned for years. And um, while he was in prison, he wrote this um, mystical text called the uh, Rosa Mir, the Rose of the World. Rosa Mira, yeah. And it's uh, Rosa Mira, and it's um, it's kind of like his on you know his Inferno, uh, and he 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 refers to Dante quite a bit in it. But it is it's this mystical, poetic attempt to sort of um, create a new mythology, a new spiritual mythology. And um, I just right. ordered that one from uh, from a oh, story okay. yesterday after after reading about it in your okay. book. Right. And one of the things it's you know it's very contemporary in the sense that. Um, He's sort of in this Sophianic tradition in, in these Russian mystical thinkers. Um, uh, Sophia, the, you know, the wisdom, the wisdom, the feminine wisdom that in the Gnostic myth and in Kabbalah and others, you know, to somehow gets shorn off from the masculine God and mm -hmm. is lost and she falls to earth and, you know, different sorts of myths and stories to account for that and the whole idea. And that's what philosophy is about, the love of wisdom, the philosophia. So the philosophers are the love, lovers of Sophia. And um, uh, Andreev is part of this. Um, Sergei Bulkakov, who's, again, he's a Silver Age one, but he's sort of back um, in being read. And he's another one who talks about, he's in this so Sophianic tradition. And, um, I mean, I was did another uh, a different interview yesterday. And one of the points I made about him is that he... He, he, he had this transition from a Marxist into, um, this more mystical thinker when he, he sort of started, un, un, started seeing nature as a who rather than a what. Mm. So it was this kind of personal encounter with this earth living, you know, feminine, you know, it's the Sophia and all that. Um, and, um, I mean, I learned that there were, you know, there's a resurgence in all these, all this stuff that was, you know, supposedly forbidden or was only kind of underground available on the underground and then um, more contemporary things like what is it the native slavic faith that's um, having a resurgence uh Rodnovery, is it called Rodnavere, right yeah so this is a return supposedly to the pagan roots before uh, I, uh, vladimir converted everybody and right well i think this is very similar to like the wicca stuff in the west well this yeah i mean that's yeah yeah i mean uh, Does it really connect to some ancient right, tradition? Right, right. Well, how are you going to know? But it's it, it works. So this is sort of like Ronald Hutton, where he says like it doesn't it it, it shouldn't be what what one shouldn't uh, see it as a negative thing that um, you know Wicca doesn't go back you know as Margaret Mary thought to you know ancient kinds of things. But you know we invent religions are invented all the time, and so. So that may very well be the case. Uh, but I guess the other thing that I, um, I didn't know about until I did the research for this and, um, I mentioned to other people and they haven't, aren't, aren't aware of it as well, but that doesn't mean much. But, um, Anastasianism, uh, um, these yeah. series of novels that, um, what is it, Vladimir, um, Megra? I don't know how you pronounce it. Megra, yeah. I, yeah. I actually like, it, I, I asked a bunch of Russians again after reading your book. We, everybody has a vague feeling that we've heard the word. But not, uh, you know, not familiar. Well, I must have been taken in by, you know, their own press releases. Propaganda, because, yeah. <laughs> the number of books called. Millions and millions of copies yeah. sold around the world. And, I, and apparently there's a large readership in the States. And I make the joke that, you know, um, whether or not Russia is interfering with the American, you know, American politics elections, we can't say for sure. But they seem to be having a big effect in, you know, the new age, you know, mm -hmm. area in the spirituality and that. So. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm not on the ground, so I don't, and you mentioned mom leave. I mean, I was able to get some stuff from different sources about, you know, relatively contemporary, say from the sixties or seventies on. Um, and I can only name check, like, was it Pelvin? Uh, Pelvin, uh, yeah. That's, that's one of the like formative writers for me. God, who's the other one? I can't think of his name right now. Who, who wrote a book about the Oprichniki? Um, oh, that's Sarokin. Yeah. 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 Those yeah, two so are, are often mentioned as like, There's a, a change in the, I guess, Russian reality, Russian politics. Mm. People say like up until maybe like mid 2000s, Pelevin was writing Russian reality. 
Okay. It was this absurd, strange, uh, mind-bending, weird. It's it's kind of connected to Sorkov's, you know, way of looking at things, right? Where everything is illusion and everything is uh, fools into you into something uh, else. Yeah. And then at some point, the mantle is given to Sorokin, who's written uh, Denya Prichnika, the day of, of the Prichnik, and uh, there's right. a sequel to that where he uses language uh more than anything like the a, a poetic kind of approach to language to describe this like i i, I think the way he approaches the the day of the appreciation is like if these people who are building you know putin and and, and his uh clique who are building this new kind of totalitarian russia with uh harkening back to the old russia and mixing it with the soviet myth and all that if they wrote a real work of art and presented their view of the world in this, mm. you know, poetically rich way, how would that look? And he produces it and right, then right. it's, it's satire, but then when you read it, it's very, you know, the, you, there's a strong sense of recognition <laughs> with the uh, imagine mm. with the, right. the reality of today and the mm. further we go more. So, I mean, now in less than a month, there's going to be a, a vote on the new, the changes to the constitution that Putin is making and there he will uh seems to be able to you know rule until his dad or or close to that he's like 16 more years uh is, is the opportunity I mean, do, do you think it's going to be a real vote or is it just you know a photo no. op <laughs> that's not that's not an expectation <laughs> we have no <laughs> sorry to just i just had to ask but yeah. um i but mean then, just can I, can I that, yeah. The, the, they're making these changes that that uh, yeah. are are closer and closer to this view of this like weird mixture of uh, Soviet and uh, Tsarist kind of Russia that uh, right. Sorokin right. Uh, wrote out very poetically. Well, you know, uh, life imitates art. I mean, God, yeah. that's you know, we've known that for a long time, and um, you know, I mean, what do you want to say? I mean, Hitler was a failed painter. If only, if only people bought his paintings. <laughs> You know, um, who knows what might have happened. Have you heard the story about uh, Lenin being a mushroom? <laughs> no, I don't know that. I, I, I know the book about Jesus being a mushroom, so he's in good company. But no, go ahead. Uh, it's, it, 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 I'm, I'm trying to use it as a segue to like the post-Soviet uh, hmm. um, confused relationship again of Russians to Russia. Hmm. It's um, Sergei Kuryokhin. Have you heard about him? No, he, was an, my head, no. he was an avant-garde um, pianist, a, a very good musician, and he uh, hung around with Dugin uh, a little bit in, in the 90s. There's definitely one uh, video that I saw that is exemplary of their kind of playful approach to politics in the yeah. 90s. There was this, it's this very bad like VHS recording that you can find on YouTube where Dugin and Kuryokhin uh, appear on TV. It's like some late night show, and uh, there was some kind of election uh, coming up. And Dugin and Kuryokhin both wore masks uh, of ancient Egyptian gods. And uh, as these gods, they presented uh, some kind of like a method for deciding who you're going to vote for. You know. Right. It, it's it's absolutely it's, it's it's theater. It's uh, making fun of everything, but it's also trying to play a part in uh, mm. the political reality somehow. Mm. And the, mm. the 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 Lenin was a mushroom is kind of a similar thing. It's a satire parody situation that became more than I think it was supposed to be. Well, isn't that the thing where the the simulation becomes the real thing, or like right. when, when 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 is a simulated terrorist? street art event turned into a real one right where, where, where's where's the dividing line and right uh, i mean that's the impression i got you know what i talk about um this more in dark star rising than in than in um, the new book but you mentioned doing you know, all there is all this kind of street kind of postmodern situation sort of thing but it, it is this whole thing about well you know uh, you you pretend to have a rally or something happening and then mm -hmm. people actually turn up well is it a real thing anymore or is it everybody just part of your conceptual art piece then uh, right. I guess this is the dangerous thing where art and politics come together art and life it goes back to this again you know the, this is what um, in the pre-Bolshevik 
period and what they picked up from from the symbolists because the symbolists had this whole idea about art supposed to be transformative. Right. Art has to have this transformative effect in some way. It can transform your life. And they, you know, they're doing it in subtle ways. It's all suggestive and elusive and things happening off, off stage. But that whole idea got picked up in the early days of Agitprop, where they were trying to use symbolist techniques in the theater to, you know, get the message across. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this, that kind of, because, I mean, in a way, not to, spin this out too tenuously politics it's not an art so much but it does want to take some kind of stuff and turn it into something else it does want to you know society right there's magic to it magic and also attempt to change it and rearrange it and Mm -hmm. oh it'll look better like that (laughs) so (laughs) art's kind of you know um that in on a different scale and uh, you know and a different sort of value dimension but you take the same idea and and Again, I, I don't, I don't want to mention, um, him across the water for me, who's running his whole reality TV show now. Everyone's watching it around the world. Um, you know, that's the thing, you know, it's like you got somebody that that's what they want to do. They want to create reality. Right. He doesn't, right. he's not interested in politics. He's interested in creating reality. Right. Right. And he's, in a way, I guess, I guess, you know, you can say Putin was doing that during the Sarkov years and still, still doing it. He's doing it still. Uh, it's just, a diff- I think the genre has changed, but, yeah, yeah. but the project is still there. So the, the anecdote about the Lenin, uh, being a mushroom, it was. Oh, yeah. We didn't, we didn't finish that. Yeah. Right. It, it was like <laughs> late, I think it was late eighties or maybe in 1990. So it was still the Soviet Union, but, uh, these like twilight years mm-hmm. of, uh, more things are open and more stranger things are available. And, uh, Kuryohin appeared on TV, uh, at a, in a show of his friend, a, a journalist, Sholokhov. And what they did, it was like a mockumentary. It was, uh, they were laughing throughout. It was very obvious that it's, it's a joke or rather it's very obvious for me now when I watch the recording, mm-hmm. but apparently it was not, uh, perceived by everybody at that time that way because TV has been for so long this medium through which you get the official party line. Mm. And so they, um, what they were doing is they were making fun of these uh, sh- TV shows, TV uh, reports that uh, started to appear where, it, you know, like alternative history type stuff, like right. uh, what really happened to that guy, you know, not ancient aliens, but that kind of, thing mm, mm. and so they they made this outlandish uh Kurokin pre- presented himself as some kind of a scholar and said that he is here to make the case for lenin actually being a mushroom and he like one of the pieces of um proof that he showed is like a drawing of the armed car on which lenin gave his famous speech and next to it a drawing of a mushroom and the mycelium body underground is like they look exactly the same the structure is very similar <laughs> and so it's 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 very you know absurd funny uh it, it's half improvised mm. uh the the theory as he presented is uh there are uh, there's evidence of lenin and other prominent bolsheviks using hallucinogenic mushrooms and what happens when you use these kinds of mushrooms for long enough, the personality of the mushroom replaces the personality of the host. And then eventually you become a mushroom in, in, in effect, a mushroom. And he said a radio wave because <laughs> mushrooms have been proven to be ready. It's, it's completely, you know, uh, overblown, absurd thing. But the important thing about it is a it became kind of a meme that's still alive today like if you right. say right. Lenin Grip Lenin is a mushroom people re- recognize the idea b uh the story goes at the time there was like an official um uh, what do you what do you call it um a request filed by the members of the Leningrad Communist Party to their uh leadership to you know, who shed light on this was or was not Lenin a mushroom. We saw this on TV. What are we supposed to think about this? And there's an official response, apparently, where the, the woman uh, who, who was given this response, she said, it's a quote, she said, um, Lenin was not a mushroom because a mammal cannot be a plant, which, of course, is suspicious because mushrooms are not plants. 
So it sounds like so it's it's this absurd thing. It leaves the door open. Yeah, but um, but the fact that this kind of like, you know, of all the weird stuff yeah, that was sure. happening at the time, this is the thing that get, got stuck in the culture. It's recognized. There are like other works of art that uh, play with this meme with this idea. Yeah, uh, tells me that there's something to it that it matches something within uh, the culture that. You know, the culture adopts it as a part of itself. Hmm. Hmm. I, I I can't comment on that, but that had, had <laughs> I had I known that, I would have added that in <laughs> to the book. That no, that that that's remarkable. I mean, no, I said there was, there was this book ages ago by John Allegro who wrote about right. the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. And I actually had a friend ages ago when I lived in Los Angeles, and I was working at um, uh, this uh, metaphysical bookshop, um, and. Um, he, he, he was a Jewish guy, but he had converted to Russian Orthodoxy. Actually, mm. he was very interested in it. And I, I remember we, this, there was a used book section and this, this, this book came in one day, you know, Jesus, the sacred cross. And I said, Hey, look, and Neil, Jesus is a mushroom. And he just got in, completely enraged and inflamed and just banging the desk saying, Jesus is not a mushroom. <laughs> so, you know, had I known Lenin, you know, was supposed to have been one too, I would have said, well, it can't be that bad. <laughs> You know, Santa Claus is supposed to be a mushroom too. Oh yeah, that's yeah. That's, well, <laughs> Everybody no was a mushroom. That, is that the the you know the mushrooms have the red dots and all that. Right, a bit, right. Isn't that Terrence McKenna country or something? I, I, he I, I, yeah, I, definitely played with it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. So. So I'm curious about again how you see the modern uh, Russia as it. You know, as as it exists, and then the kind of political project of coming up with a new identity mm. for it is it. I don't know what the question is. It is it convincing to you what uh, Putin is trying to do? Is it uh, the the image that he is putting together? Is it? Well, I mean, I I think it has to be convincing to the Russian people more than anybody else. I mean, right. I would think you know. I mean, I'm um. I mean, I'm 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 not writing the. How should I say that? Um, I you know I'm. Objective, you know, I'm trying to be in the sense of, um, um, you know, I'm, what are you going to say? And the, the tone carries whatever hint of approval or disapproval, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have. It's not any direct attack or anything like that. And as I say, you know, it, 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 if, you know, it makes sense that, say, whenever it was five years or so ago or something when, when Putin went into Crimea and, and Ukraine and all that, it makes sense in the history of Russia that he would do that, you know, because the right, Kiev was, right, you know, right. the start of it all. And there's the whole idea of the statue of Vladimir the first that he has, you know, just outside of the Kremlin, I'm, I'm what yep. I understand. So it's kind of like, well, guys, if you know the history, it, it make it makes sense. I'm not saying it should happen or, you know, talk to the Crimeans and the Ukrainians and see what they, what they have to say about it. But um, um, it, it's just like, it makes sense. So um, a lot of and I don't know how much Dugan actually, his influence or any of his ideas filtered in, but he too was talking about this sort of thing a few years in advance. It's in that book, I think, The Foundations of um, Geopolitics or something like that, if I'm mis with, mispronouncing With Dugan, the there was this moment that I found. I mean, I I don't think Dugan is directly, uh, you know, responsible for, for much of the stuff like that, that he's hmm. uh, influencing the situation directly. But I think his... Things that Dugan has been expressing, uh, you know, they find expression in other ways too. And, mm -hmm. you know, Dugan mm -hmm. is somebody who Putin yeah. would be aware of. Um, yeah. but, but then well, he I'm, draws I'm not saying on, he's sort of running the show, but just sort of like, you know, Chinese whispers. It gets, it right. gets there and it seems to the, kind of. The, 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 there, kind there's of, a, a moment in, in that I saw some interview with Dugan some years later, uh, 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 after after Crimea, and uh, the question that was posed to him is like, there was a time, remember, right after or during the Crimean situation, where it seemed like you would say a thing, and then like a week later, it becomes reality, and it huh. seemed like almost Putin is listening to you, and now it's changed. Like there's a divergence between what you're saying and huh. what huh. Putin is doing. How do you explain that? And Dugin, I don't think he like missed the beat. He said he he had a whole theory about a solar Putin. And, oh, uh, right. and Moon Putin, Putin. and yeah. uh, there was the solar Putin that was, that was doing things correctly at the time, and then mm -hmm. uh, you know the cycle changed, and then there's, yeah. and which again kind of plays into there's like this whole 
I don't think it's it's been expressed, uh, or at least I haven't seen it expressed in like a, a word of uh, fiction or anything. But there is this within the, um, as I say, folk mythology. There is a bunch of different expressions of these ideas about Putin's weird nature. There's the good Putin and the bad Putin. There's most of it again is jokes. There's like a poem about the good Putin being chained. Um, underneath the Kremlin, and it's the evil black Putin that's doing all the evil stuff here. Wow. Wow. Uh, and and I think there's there's something to it, and I think that maybe again this uh, idea that there is no Putin is an expression of uh, a, a a reality, a, a pretty you know straightforward reality of us not knowing what Putin hmm. actually thinks. Uh, mm -hmm. Him playing different roles, him, him doing these uh, mm -hmm. weird like spectacles, saving the cranes or whatever. He always has some some weird mm -hmm. thing uh, going on. But I think his relationship to all of these ideological things and and philosophical ideas that he's he's using, uh, I think it's very practical, and and I think he's oh, yeah. kind of. Kind of open about it in some in some case. I remember definitely in one uh, instance. Maybe it was in those Oliver Stone documentaries that he did, or interviews that Oliver Stone did mm -hmm. with Putin, where he openly like he, he, the interviewer was asking him about the importance of Christianity, or Russian Orthodoxy, and Putin, while embracing it wholeheartedly, uh, Christianity and other traditional religions uh, in Russia, he made it clear and explicit that there has to be something like the Soviet ideology is not there anymore and there can be a vacuum there needs to be an ideology in the country this is the next thing that we have so we're doing this now hmm. Hmm. well I mean that's the impression I get again um, is that trying to find something well you said like the, the genre has changed mm -hmm. so you entertain the people for a, a, that, that worked for quite some time and then it seemed to that kind of ran out of steam and right. exhausted its potential. And um, it's sort of, you know, return to a former greatness or reemerge. I mean, it's the two opposites. Let's return to this former greatness, you know, the, let's reclaim the near abroad and somehow, you know, reunite the fallen empire. And then it's also, we are this new rising civilization that's completely new, you know, in the 21st century and we're not, you know, we're not a backward cousin to the West and it's the, you know, the America, it's not the age of America anymore and, you know, um, and so on and so on. So it seems to be kind of very different, but they're both similarly geared towards giving a new identity, right. giving a new narrative. Right. You know, I mean, I, I think that's, that's the thing. And I think, you know, he's, he's right. You know, you, uh, in some way, and this, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not really a political thinker. I just kind of, I, strangely slipped into writing about politics because, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, because there's a lot of weird stuff happening in it these days. But I do think in the West, that's what the West has lost. The West has lost its narrative, at least the American democratic, you know, free market, what, what, what I call in the book, the me economy, you know, because it doesn't have a narrative anymore. The narrative is about, you could have it, you could have anything you want, you know, have it right. your way or with right. Burger King, whatever it is, burgers are. And, uh, you know, um, so it's all about, you know, how can I, how can I make, how can I rearrange the world around me to suit me, how, how, how I want it to be, uh, and whatever that might be, you know, whatever, you know, uh, and this liberating at first and wonderful freedom, but then it gets amorphous and there's no boundaries anymore. And, um, there's no longer anything to liberate yourself from. And I'm, I'm not talking, I'm not saying there aren't people that need to be liberated. I'm talking about, you know, the, the majority of well-off, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, people that are, um, have live in the standard of living that, you know, one's actually ever uh, been able to experience before and all that. And it, it seems to, you know, lost its way. It seems to be drifting and not knowing where to go and, and all that. And um, <clears throat> I think it's true. I, I, I think you do need some kind of of narrative it doesn't have to be something that's imposed on you it could be something that arises out of the people or or you know something that you share so a set of beliefs and all that but 
um, whether what Putin is doing is the right thing to do or, or uh, it's not, not, not so much condoning it as recognizing that, well, it makes sense. And it, it is something that's, that's, that's sort of needed, I, I would think, to, you know, keep a, a country going. I mean, uh, but, you know, obviously, I mean, one of the, <laughs> well, you, you must have seen some of these funny videos that was made after Trump did the, you know, make America great or America first kind of thing. And then you had, I don't know, the Netherlands, can we be number two? <laughs> and, you know, so lots of countries have, they have a great sense of humor and all that. And so they have their own story, but it doesn't have, doesn't have to be this, you know, right. macho hero kind of one. Um, but I think when you were a power that was, you know, one of the great super, the, the other great superpower, and then you've, you've lost that position to sort of regain something like that, but, you know, I'm not surprised. Yeah, there, and, there's uh, absolutely, as they say, there's a lot of anxiety among just Russians uh, about that. Like, who are we? Uh, is there, like, I before your book came out, I remember talking to my brother um, and just mentioning that I'm looking forward to the book coming out and then the opportunity to speak to you. And we only had, like, the title and the basic premise, you know, outlined in the editor's description uh, to go on. And... It was, it was a funny thing. Like before that, I saw him. We did this thing, ask a Russian on the uh, uh, non-zero newsletter page where people ask questions and I would try to answer them about Russia. And my brother came into that comment section and he kept doing the things that you write about in the book that is a part, part of the character. Like people are, were asking, Particular political questions oftentimes, like, you know, uh, should the Baltic states be concerned about Russian aggression? And then my brother would show up and go, I don't think metaphysically Russia is an aggressor. And then he would, would write these long things about the idea of Russia, of Russia as it actually is, as opposed to what is expressed in the real mm. world and all of that stuff. And I was like, you're not helping. This is... <laughs> the, the image is getting worse. And yet then we're sitting at this bar and I mentioned your book. And again, we didn't really know what the book was going to be about really, uh, except for, you know, there's the return of the Holy Russia. And he kind of sighed and was like, do you think there's anything worthwhile in modern Russia? Is there any idea to even, you know, investigate and explore? Because it seems to me it's just a bunch of people trying to steal shit. And it's that, like, in, in him, and I, I brought it up to him, like, you, you spoiled my common situation by talking about eternal Russia when people were asking about, are you going to invade a country or not? And now you're saying there's none of this, you know, ideal, eternal anything here. And he said, yeah, when I speak to foreigners, I feel like, you know, when a Shanka hat emerges on my, and I, and I start sounding like Putin or somebody. But in his example... Or, or the example of him is uh, characteristic of this, like, we need something. We need, we, that there used to be an identity. Uh, it, even, you know, when the Americans started to, to blame Russia for, or part of Americans, right? Uh, Russia suddenly became this boogeyman that's responsible for everything bad that's happening in America mm -hmm. for some of them. I saw in some Russians simultaneously you know, they would scoff at it. They would say it's, it's ridiculous. But then there was a little bit of like warmth of like, they're noticing <laughs> us. At least we're in, in the story. They're talking right. about us. At least yeah, we're yeah. not completely peripheral <clears throat> as we've been for, uh, you know, a little while. Mm. Mm. So I don't know if Putin's going to be successful with, with his thing. I mean, just now, you know, the pandemic led to a cancellation or uh, postponing of the, Victory Day Parade uh, for, for the, for the uh, Second World War. And I was just seeing, um, you know, Putin's biggest critic, Navalny, talking about, so now they're going to do this parade a week before the, or rather they do the parade on a Wednesday at the end of June, and there's a week of voting on these changes into the Constitution, oh, and then right. another day off at the end of that. Mm. And when Putin said that there's going to be a parade, he talked with such pride, like we're going to do, we, we, we must do this very important thing to the parade. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what I heard from Navalny and what I hear from Russians ordinarily 
nobody cares about the parade. Nobody, <laughs> nobody needs the parade. There are other concerns. I mean, it's a thing on TV. You can watch. It's fun. You can see a, you know, a tank go by, but nobody really cares, but he presents it. And I think for him, like these are the tools that he works with. He needs to create these realities. And I think he does think that the parade is essential to, you know, carry on this project of establishing some kind of an identity. Mm. I mean, wasn't it Belarus who had it anyway? Um, it was must, the news. Mean, Belarus didn't do anything about the pandemic at all. Lukashenko was yeah, like, but there was, at least it was on the news here that they had that the, you know the May Day or the you know the parade you're talking about that was postponed. They they went ahead and did it anyway, and it was just huge. At least what I saw on the news it was just a huge kind of thing. And uh, I think it was for similar reasons. I, I don't I don't remember um, the president or whatever his name, but there was some election coming up. And so mm, it was, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I guess it instills some kind of, you know, patriotism. I mean, if you get, if you don't, I think in some ways, if you don't have that, people just start thinking about like day to day things. They think about them anyway, but, but they just start thinking about day to day things. How do I pay these? How do I deal with this? Why doesn't this work? And right, all that kind right. of stuff. <laughs> and then, then that's trouble, you know, cause then you'll, you'll, no parade is going to, you know, fix that. Um, and I guess in the States, it's the same kind of thing, you know, yeah, these rallies and these huge kind of things. And, um, I, I, you know, I mean, I mean, can I just ask uh, off, sure. off message? What, seeing what's happening in the States, I mean, uh, what do you think, you know, how does it translate over there? What do you, what, what, is, what does it sound like all the chaos that's going on there now? And it's, it's just um, horrific. It, it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm watching it. Uh, it, it looks, very intense and looks also very American in like where, where th- there's a part of it. There's like, special effects. Right. Th- th- it's all <laughs> very theatrical and movie like, and, yeah. and there's yeah. like a lot of gestures and everybody's participating in everything in, in different ways. Mm. Like it's, I mean, there are layers and, and kind of turns to it. There's the looting. There's the like, protesters who fix up the things that were broken by other protesters. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, I think that's one of the, it, I, it, with my girlfriend, again, we've been watching the, what's happening in America. And then, you know, we consume American uh, pop culture and media and all that. Mm-hmm. And the a thing that keeps coming up is one of the differences between, you know, Russia today, at least certainly uh, in, in our lifetime and in America is just, America is, you mentioned Gumilov in your book. He has this passionarity term. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, like yeah. A, a vital force. And in America, it, it seems very alive. Everybody's fighting mm-hmm. everybody else. There is like heroes appearing. There's Im- new images that just emerge. Like even before the these riots, like the pandemic, I remember watching it. And, you know, there are people with guns in uh, Michigan or wherever saying that, uh, you know, country needs to be opened up. Then on the other hand, there are nurses showing up to a protest to protest the protest. And the nurse becomes this image of a hero at the front lines fighting. Mm. And, and, and meanwhile, in Russia, we have the pandemic too, but it, we just kind of go like whatever the, the authorities make particular yeah. decisions, something is enacted yeah. and then people, are forced to go about it, but nobody's trying to influence the situation. Mm-hmm. And in America, it seems like everybody's trying to influence in everything. Well, I mean, there's, well, it's, what do you want to say? Divisive is, is, isn't even right. you know, coming close anymore. It's completely fragmenting and fracturing. And um, yeah, I mean, well, it's the, I don't want to make, well, well I was going to say I don't want to make generalizations, but I make them all the time. But, um, you know, there seems something, you know, the people who, have the guns or the ones who don't want to stay in lockdown. And they're also the ones now, you know, if, if God forbid something does happen and does turn into something larger than, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen uprising on some tweets, but it's protest and riot isn't quite an uprising. Yeah. Right. Not that I, not that I want it to be, but if it, if that happened, you know, it's all these other people that have the guns really. And it's, um, no, I, I can't even. It's so saddening to me to you know to watch to watch it happen, and um, um, it's. Um, but it, it it is this. I, I can't believe you, these pictures of the police. They're so. Yeah. Uh, people say people say they're like RoboCop. You know, I mean, they're just yeah. armed to the teeth and protected to the teeth, and you just have 
Yeah, you know, the yeah. This all the, I mean, the sad, sadly, it's it's. What do you want to say? It's a legitimate protest against something that was absolutely horrible. Should never have happened. The people involved should have been arrested immediately. Um, and then that gets you know, there's legitimate and understandable anger, and then there's people who hijack it, you know, for a variety of different reasons to make it into something else, and then there's this response. You know, not from all the police, from, you know, many of them. That is really, you know, disproportionate. And then you have the man who's supposed to be guiding, you know, the nation into, should be into some kind of, you know, peace or at least, you know, a truce or something. And he's talking about dominating and all of this and, and thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers. Mm-hmm, and it's mm-hmm. just, I'm, I'm here in sleepy London town. You know, it's like, I can't, and I'm watching it on TV and I'm thinking, my God, what is happening over there? So no, it I, looks I, like I, a movie I, I, completely. Went yeah. off topic, but it was, yeah, well, that's what I mean. It was sort of like his reality TV show. And, right, and by right, saying right. that, I'm not trying to diminish, you know, the real heart of it, which was a real protest, but then it gets taken over right. um, by this sort of thing. And it seems in some way, it's like a, an opportunity for him to show, you know, I'm tough and I'm not going to, you know, right. um, you know, take this kind of thing. So I, I, I had a thought just now uh, to tie this all together. Um, so we've talked about the Russian um, struggles with the Russian identity, which is always like always, always that there's a project of of becoming the Russia that you you think about, and we're never quite there. And I was I was just talking to an American friend about this, about the similarities and differences between American and Russian. Um, relationship to the idea of respectively America and Russia. Right. And, uh, the similarity is maybe that, that there is a, it's a project, like there is an idea of what the country is and you're trying to make it that or, or uphold it. And the difference or one of the differences that, uh, came up in, in this conversation with my American friend is that I said that I don't know if it's me or my generation of Russians, but it's definitely, you know, tied to me being born, uh, right before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I was growing up during this, like, ideologically chaotic, uh, vacuous sure. kind of time. And I think that my anxiety about the Russian identity or what Russia is, is lessened, uh, compared to, like, my parents, generation who went through the 90s you know the mm. uh, another collapse of a version of what uh is going on go, going on here because to me it's like you know looking back at the history i see iterations and i know that russia persists even after a particular version of it dies so it's like you had the russian empire that's gone in in its place was supposed to be a a complete antithesis to it, uh, and that lasted for seventy years, and then that was gone. And uh, the nineties were this like tumultuous time where it was not clear. Now Putin is building one thing. I sort of expect it to not, you know, I I hope to live longer than Putin's version of Russia, and and the, the, I'm I kind of feel. I don't feel very nervous about this idea of Russia, of what I think Russia is, because that thing keeps, uh, you know, existing even after particular versions of it, uh, you know, this state or that state or regime mm. die. And and the, this uh, friend of mine who's American said, I think that's very different for Americans because they think if, if we lose what we are or what we think we are on all of the sides that are involved in the, in these conflicts, right? So for one, there's this, whatever, it's a white country or Anglo something country, the Western, uh, you know, heritage or whatever. And on the other hand, there's the people who believe in the, what's written in the bill of rights and the, yes. the, the equality and all that. But for all of them, there's something big at stake and, if they don't come to a shared identity, they don't come to a consensus or one of them doesn't win, you know, if, if the country isn't what they think it is or is supposed to be, then what is it? What What's going to come after that? Does that make sense to you? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, Amer- you know, it has been for a while. I mean, um, but it's going through an identity crisis uh, now. 
And um, it's also, again, especially it's America first kind of thing where we're no longer the policemen or we're no mm-hmm. longer going to solve the problems of the world. We're like, well, well, what, what is, what does it mean now anymore to be American? Cause that was, that was the thing. America was supposed to be you know, the, the good guys, you know, the land of the free, the leader of the free world and all of that. And, um, you know, whether it should still be that or not is a different question, but when that is, kind of gone in a way or put it this way it's not gone but it's not as secure and unquestioned as it was before and there's some people who are absolutely you know we don't need to do that we, we can still be a power in the world but we don't need to do right. all the stuff we're trying to do and there's others saying no we're, we're america we're great we you know we the people the rest of the world has to respect us and all all this kind of thing and they want to regain this you know um prior sense of I guess a late 1950s, early 60s sense of America and in, in some way, you know, a real leader of the free world kind of thing. And, and then there's all the stuff that comes out that says, well, actually, it wasn't quite like that. Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, you know, there's, we all have feet of clay and all of that. And, and I would say now, I mean, sadly, I don't, I don't want to go back to it again, but just when I see comments of people on Twitter from different parts of the world, it is this kind of thing like, well, <laughs> Is this America, you know, now you, right. you, you, you're, you, you're, you know, you basically, you condemn all this sort of stuff in other parts of the world, but what, what's happening there. So no, yeah. I, I think there's a profound identity crisis uh, um, going on there and it is leading to these kinds of schisms and these kinds of, you know, battles. There was the people who believed in the melting pot. That was the whole idea. I mean, when I, uh, my parents born in the twenties and in the thirties um, and, um, I remember asking them about their background, you know, because they came from Europe, their family back back to European roots. Mm-hmm. Actually, on one side of my my father's family, he said from Ukraine. I never found out exactly where, uh, Galicia or somewhere like that. Or that uh, any case, but um, it was sort of like, well, we don't know that because that's the old world. We're Americans. I mean, they were born in America, but you know, their parents they said, no, we don't, we've got rid of the old world. We're Americans right. now. We all kind of you know part of this thing together. And that was the idea I grew up with in the sixties and all that. And it's a small world after all. And, you know, we're all, we're all different, but we all get together and all that, you know, you had the euphemism of the salad bowl, but you know, it's not, it's even getting worse than that. Now it is this fracturing into all the, you said this kind of war of all against all, you know, that, right, that seems right. to be certainly happening. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just kind of seeing it, you know, from my safe perch here in, in London, seeing it kind of, you know, um, what do you want to kind of like um, separate and congeal into you know different kinds of things you know like a kind of pudding or I don't know some kind of liquid sort of thing you have and then it it, it if if you leave it too long bits of it will congeal into other bits and um, it's just um, and then they're all kind of fi- fighting each other so I mean I don't know I I I I don't have any words of wisdom to offer to make it any better but I certainly do think America is going through an identity crisis and um, I mean I'm I, mean, I lived here in London for 25 years. I'm not a Brit. I, I was about to ask, how do you do? You feel as a part of some like cultural narrative? Uh, are you European, American? Well, I'm, 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 an Amer- I'm an American who loved Europe. I grew up as an Anglophile and and um, a Europhile. Um, so uh, not that I didn't like uh, America, that you know, but I, I born in. I'm, I'm a late boomer. Born in '55. Grew up during the '60s. What I see now is very much, you know, what was happening right. um, back in '68. Uh, um, although I, this seems to me on, on a bigger scale, um, and um, but I mean, I'm unavoidably American. Uh, I can't get rid of that. But and I didn't. I'm not consciously tried to be. I mean, I'm, I'm not a Brit. I'm, I'm a Londoner in the way that people who live in New York, you know, from, right. from other that places, turn out to be New Yorkers. So I, I become a Londoner and all that. So this cosmopolitan. Kind of thing. But no, I certainly have this narrative where I, you know, I, I, the great books narrative or the great teachers narrative, you know, this kind of an intellectual, cultural, imaginative heritage, which is, you know, shared, you know, it's mostly English, English language for me, but a lot of my the great writers I you know, love from Germany, from, you know, from uh, Russia as well. It's all in translation. But so I, I feel part of that, you know, that life of the mind and that, and it's, that's cosmopolitan, you know, it's international. It's um, up above, you know, um, the, the 
sort of neuroses of politics and all that, and or one would like it to be. Um, so that, that that that's how I feel. You know, I'm 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 I, I want to be part of that conversation. You know, with the, right. Right. I want to sit in on that great conversation that's been going on for several hundred years with all of these different thinkers and writers and all that and try to get some sense of where things are going. And um, I mean, I, I tend to say now that the future's caught up to us uh, because it's sort of like this thing that was supposed to be way out there ahead of us. But now ooh, we find ourselves here very, very uh, more quickly than we thought we were going to arrive and we're not quite ready for it. So yeah. uh, we're, we're like we're in the midst of history happening now, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, as uh, uh, was it Napoleon who pointed that out? So it's something along those lines now. All right. Well, that's that's a note to end on. We are in the right. midst of history happening now. Yeah. Right. This this well, pandemic my... too. My sense is it's condensed the time so so much. So many things are happening, uh, you know, quicker. Absolutely. I mean, it's a. I mean, in Russian history, there's the it's the time of troubles. I guess you know um, before the Romanovs you know, and, and Boris Goodenough's time and all that. But the like the 20th century historian Arnold Toynbee, he took that kind of phrase and, and applied it to different civilizations. He's saying mm-hmm. civilizations go through this challenge and response kind of cycle. And they, they reach the time and they have their time of troubles and they have to find a way to respond to it. And he, he, he has what I call the Goldilocks theory of history. I don't know if you know the the Goldilocks fairy tale. Right, right, the astronomical. But, you know, so the thing is for... for um, uh, Toynbee, if the challenge is too great, then the, the civilization is smashed by it. If it's not great enough, it overcomes it too easily, becomes complacent, and goes through a you know decline. But if it's just right, just as like Goldilocks, this porridge is too hot, this is too cold, this is just right. So if the challenge is just right, then the culture and civilization is able to generate the creative energy to overcome the immediate challenge, but also to push itself into you know the next stage. So let's just hope that's what's happening now. I was reading a thing on, on like Russians responding, Russian like analysts and, and writers, journalists responding to the pandemic and all the issues connected to it, the economic crisis that would, would come with it. And uh, a bunch of them pointed out that Russian history goes through is like, you know, like the Brezhnev's year where nothing is happening for a couple of decades uh-huh. and it's just stale and, 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 and there's no growth. And then something really bad happens, and then only then, then the the nation somehow pulls together, or the culture pulls together, and comes up with yeah. some or the twenties, the the civil war. Um, yeah. So there's a hope that this challenge now is going to produce some kind of creative outburst too. But yeah. we'll see. We'll see. We certainly will. And that's always the hope. So, well, thank you so much for the conversation and the book. I'm still reading it and uh, enjoying it thoroughly. Well, my pleasure, and thanks for giving me a chance to talk about it. So um, let's stay in touch. Do svidaniya. Do svidaniya.